Um, hi, everyone. We might just make a start and then other people can join as we come along. Um, thank you, everyone, for making the time today to attend uh, Professor Stephen Billett's webinar, Models and Processes of Post-Practical Interventions. So first, we'd like to start with the acknowledgement of country. Bagel, Nayang, Jimbalungs. Good day, friends. My name is John Graham. I'm a proud Kumba Mary man, a saltwater man of the Gold Coast region. Our people are part of the wider Yugan Bear language group. The Kumbamiri lands stretch from the Goomera Goomera, the Goomera River to the north, down to the Tweed River in the south, bordered by the beautiful Pacific Ocean and the foothills of the Great Dividing Range. I'd like to acknowledge my elders past, present and emerging, for as I say, it all welcomes. It is important to recognise the hard work that our old people did in dark times and we continue that legacy into today so that we can also pass on that reconciled state onto our young people because they're the bearers of the flame, the keepers of the knowledge and keep our culture strong into the future. I'd also like to pay my respects to the spirit of this land and her people, which includes all of you here today. My authority to speak today comes from Waru, my apical ancestor, whose connection through her daughter, Jenny Graham, passed on through Frank, Jack and Leonard Graham, my father, allows me to speak with authority uh, on Kumbamiri land uh, and so that we uh, acknowledge this place. Please respect this place as you go about your business and walk within our lands because that respect is reciprocal. We need you to maintain that reciprocity while you are within Kumbamiri lands and other places on other campuses that people may be studying on. Welcome to this country. It's a special place. Please respect each other, respect the country and her people and the fauna and flora. It's important that you do this, that we maintain this into the future. Anyabu, anyabu, until we meet again. Thank you. Um, I was going to just quickly introduce myself. So my name's Louise and I'd like to introduce Samia and we're from the Service Learning Unit and we're here to, here to assist with the webinars. But now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Billett. So Dr. Stephen Billett is a professor of adult and vocational education in the School of Education and Professional Studies at Griffith University and a National Teaching Fellow and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. After a career in garment manufacturing, he has worked as a vocational educator, educational administrator, teacher educator, professional development practitioner, and a policy developer in the Australian vocational educational system, and as a teacher and research at Griffith University. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Billett. Thanks, Louise, and I will share my screen. Thanks, folks, for coming along to this um, webinar. And this is the second of a series of three webinars, which are a dissemination strategy, I guess, for the National um, Office of Learning and Teaching grant that I had, uh, well, I led, I beg your pardon, on augmenting students' learning for employability through post practicum educational processes. Alas, the Office of Learning and Teaching is no more, no longer with us, but this is a process of disseminating the findings from that project under the auspices of the Commonwealth Government. And the idea originally was to engage with folk face to face around the country, but you all understand why that's not possible. So, um, I'll just start by saying there's, there's three webinars. The first one, which um, was last week on the 10th of November, focused on the purposes and approaches to post-practicum interventions. And the question we addressed last week was for what purposes and through what approaches would post-practicum interventions be effective in your field of teaching? And this week's session is on models and processes of post-practicum interventions. And the, the question we're addressing here is what are the qualities of models of post-practicum interventions and their enactment that would be pertinent for 
and effective in your field of teaching. And then next week, the third and final one is um, on engaging with time jealous students. And that is how do we come to engage with students who have got overlapping commitments and are becoming increasingly time precious or time jealous in terms of how they commit themselves to their university studies, but in particular, when um, there are additional requirements, such as engaging in practicum experiences and then activities that then seek to integrate those uh, experiences within their overall curriculum. Um, so the question for next week is, how can contemporary time jealous students be assisted to engage effortfully in post practicum activities to achieve effective out learning outcomes for them? Now, one of the issues, of course, with um, having a series of three webinars is that um, to what degree do I repeat and rehearse stuff that I've mentioned in earlier ones? And there are different folk participating today than last week. So I will have to just rehearse a few things that I went through last week, but I will be hopefully, hopefully that'll be reasonably fresh and not too long term. Okay. So, as I said, the focus for this webinar um, draws upon this grant, this Office of Learning and Teaching grant on post-practicum interventions, and looking at some of the uh, interventions that were trialed to see how, what, and look at what specific teaching and learning strategies were used to augment, augment those experiences with a key focus on promoting student employability. And some of the models will, um, Offering will offer you, the participants, some basis to consider what might work in your area of teaching. And so as I've already foreshadowed, the um, question for this, this second webinar is what are the qualities of models of post-practicum interventions and, and their enactment that would be pertinent for and effective in your field of teaching? And by the way, should um, you have any questions along the way through, please feel free to um, put them in the, 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 the chat box. And should there be a burning question you want to ask, I'm fairly comfortable in terms of, I think you can raise your hand and Louise or Sama will, will then relay the question to me or allow you to speak the question. I think that's, that's if you want to do that, that's, that's fine. Okay, so let's just start with some, some basic precepts or premises that help me understand how, um, how I, I think about and the basis for some of this study. So the first one is that, that there's a duality that we always need to consider, and that is on the one hand, what the social world affords opportunities, both in terms of through educational institutions, but also workplaces and how individuals come to engage with what is afforded. And that sounds very technical, but you know, whether we're talking about experiences in the workplace or in educational settings, these are sets of experiences which are provided. However, ultimately, it's how individuals elect to engage with them, um, which is important. And the adage which I use a lot is that we, we need to remind ourselves that educational experiences are merely invitations to change. That is, they're invitations, but learners, students need to take up that invitation. And even the best resource, the best thought through um, processes, and we'll hear some examples of that today, will be for little if students don't wish to engage with them. And the integration of experiences is associ associated with learning. It's a personal fact. So students have experiences in different places and it, how they come to reconcile those experiences to make sense of them is down to them as a person in some sense. What will be of interest to some people and worthwhile engaging um, for some people, for others, they will see this as an unnecessary burden, a chore. So it is that personal process that students engage in, in reconciliation. Um, Hence, I think it's important that as the field of work integrated learning has grown and I see it being used widely, I think it's very important to understand and distinguish between work integrated learning and work integrated education. The former is 
how people come to engage with and learn from these experiences, which, um, which includes having experiences in both settings and trying to bring them together. And that's something which people do, as is learning. And then there's work integrated education. And that is what much of us do. We try and provide experiences. We try and organize experiences within the education institution, you know, increasingly through this type of media at the moment because of the impacts of uh, coronavirus. And then um, we then try and provide experiences in the workplace and then we try and integrate them. And so this project that's about post-practical interventions is very much sitting within the concept of work integrated education, the provision of experiences to achieve particular kind of goals. And last week, we talked about those goals. Now, in advancing this, I'm not, sim I'm not seeking to denigrate people who use the word work integrated learning to describe what they're doing. And often that subsumes um, work integrated education. But I think we're at the stage now with the development of this work integrated learning movement that it's important we distinguish between the two. Why do I say that? Well, I've seen the same thing happen in, you know, in considerations of workplaces as informal learning environments, and then they get a particular connotation. But also, if you look at the literature and what government says about something called lifelong learning, which is something that people do, you'll find that all too often when lifelong learning is mentioned, it refers to the provision of experiences, lifelong education. And one of the limitations of that is that by capturing lifelong learning as lifelong education, a whole range of experiences are missed out, particularly those that adults learning through, through their working life, for instance. So I just think it's necessary to distinguish between these two concepts as the field matures and grows. And um, there's this a need within all of this to consider student agency and engagement um, to support rich and effective learning and to press learners into higher order activities. What we know is that regardless of whether we're talking about the experiences we provide in the university setting or in the workplace, that um, ultimately learners are the ones who decide how they engage with activities. And if they engage in activities in a superficial way to pass the assignment or to meet some, um, some goal that somebody else has been set for them, it's less likely that they will um, develop higher order thinking and, and uh, procedural abilities than if they are interested and engaged in those activities. For instance, when Louise was introducing to me, she mentioned that I had a long history of working in the garment industry. And then I used to work in the, in the fashion area, believe it or not, um, within TAFE. And, you know, my students used to design and manufacture and make their own garments. I never had any problems with classroom management. Um, the students were actively engaged in realizing the garments they desired. And this pressed them then, their activity and their problem solving pressed them into higher order forms of activities. And it's that kind of excitement and interest that I think is helpful to secure that effortful processes of engaging in those kind of activities and learning. And also the need to engage interdependently, that is to engage with others, other students, teachers, technologies, text, et cetera, in a way which is interdependent. And of course, so many forms of work require us to be able to work with others effectively and rely upon each other for our, our, our work practice, but also learning. And I also inserted this um, today because this seemed to be important. And the concept of readiness. Now, those of you who are familiar with the concept of readiness probably think back to Piaget and Piaget's stages of human development or child development, really. And what Piaget, Piaget's concept of readiness was associated with movement through biological stages of growth. And the idea is that, um, that as you move through biologically, as you matured, you developed a capacity to engage in a kind of thinking and acting which wasn't possible before. And that wasn't just an, an evolving cognitive ability, it was also an ability be, to be critical. 
So whereas the very young child might believe that Santa Claus, you know, came around to every, every house in Australia, powered by the boomers, at a certain age, they develop critical insights and begin to, to question that. So it's, it's the, the capacity that it evolves. However, with adults, I think more broadly, um, readiness um, is about having the knowledge um, to be able to engage effectively with experiences from, from, from which we want to learn. So for instance, if you were to insert me now into a, a country where I know nothing about the language and I'm hopeless with languages, it, it wouldn't be a good learning experience because I wouldn't simply wouldn't have the, the ability to make sense of what is being spoken. I wouldn't have the, stru the language structures to make sense of it. So part of um, an important part of readiness is how we prepare our students and at what point are they ready to engage in experiences in the workplace and what kind of experiences. So without the kind of capacities that um, they would have, so that they'd have, the, the actual workplace experience might not be terribly effective. As I said earlier, I was a mature age student when I came to, um, um, as Louise said, beg your pardon, when I came. So I find myself joining higher education in my 30s um, doing a diploma of teaching TAFE. And because I went to the progressive education system in uh, Britain, um, I, where people like myself weren't taught English uh, language, we were taught English literature, we weren't taught English language. It was called progressive education. It wasn't very progressive at all because I wasn't taught um, grammar, syntax, etc. When I arrived in to do my higher education, um, through, uh, through what is now Griffith, but it's called Macrobat Teachers College then, I didn't know what a sentence was. And I didn't know what I didn't know. All I knew is that a sentence had the first letter was capital and, this, and at the end of a full stop came up. But I simply didn't know what a sentence was. And when people said that's not a sentence, I didn't have the, the ability to know what I'd done wrong. So that's what readiness is about. And you know, in the context of work integrated learning is preparing students so that when they go into the workplace, they have capacities to be able to make sense and engage um, productively and learn productively. And I just want to rehearse this concept about time jealousy that, you know, my view, rightly or wrongly, is that contemporary students are not time poor, they're time jealous. And the difference between time poverty and time jealousy is that Time poor is I don't have time, whereas time jealousy is students needing to strategically use their time and identify to what activities they will engage, what they will put efforts in. And setting activities which, for instance, aren't assessed or the students don't think are important is unlikely to achieve the kind of engagements which I've referred to um, above. So, you know, if a student is only engaging superficially, you won't get that rich and effective learning, you won't get the higher order, and you might not get an effective inter interdependent engagement. But there's also the issue of time jealous teachers. Everybody's very busy and in the current era, we're all gonna get a lot busier as we work in resource poor um, universities. And so, you know, time jealousy is also a, a component it sitting within work integrated education, will teachers have the time to engage and enact the very post practicum interventions about which we'll be talking. And by the way, there's the other um, resource jealousy and that is workplaces are under pressure to provide the workplace experiences. And you know, often they're not able to do that. And it's interesting, the new policies from Minister Tiernan seem to assume that workplaces are you know, open and welcoming of, 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 of students of all kinds and want to engage with higher education institutions to negotiate individual workplace arrangements, which I don't think is, is terribly realistic. And it's also very resource demanding. Okay, so they're just some premises upon how we might think about the, the topics for this talk. So as, as we know, uh, this webinar, sorry, as we know um, that there's a growing focus within tertiary education and both higher and vocational education about providing students with work experience and increasingly 
this has got a specific focus on, uh, on, on their job readiness and how the, that learning can support them across their working lives. Um, so this emphasis is on, is on integrating students' experiences and this probably requires careful planning and alignment with specific educational goals, which is what the session last week was about. And so a key element of, of work integrated education is using student experiences to promote, to promote these outcomes. And this focus then is how can we augment or enrich students work experiences once they've had them. And across these three seminars, the first one, as I've said, was about the goals for it. And this one's about curriculum and pedagogic practices. And then, and then the third one is about engaging students. And so that's rehearsing what I've already said. Now, if we go to back and think about three concepts of curriculum, which I think are important, the intended curriculum, that is what is planned, the enacted curriculum, what is implemented, and then the experience curriculum, what students make sense of it. What we see is what's in these three webinars. The first one was really focused on the intended curriculum. What are the goals um, that are so, sought to be achieved? And last week we looked at not only what the goals the educational institutions wanted, but what are the goals the students wanted, which seems kind of important. And then, then the one in the middle is really what we're talking about today. What is, what is implemented, the enacted curriculum. And you'll see the considerations here are, you know, maximizing the available opportunities, considering the range of supervise, you know, the range of options available to provide those experiences, accounting for student readiness um, when selecting experiences, and then what additional experiences might be needed to support students learning. And then next week we'll be looking at the experience curriculum how students make sense of it and how we can engage them in that. Okay, so this project then was to promote student learning associated with employability through post-practical interventions. It commenced as following. Firstly, we had a developmental conference with the folk who were um, from health and, and social care that comprised the 14 projects in the first round of projects. And so across 2016, as I recall, um, those, those folk implemented their projects and they're the ones I'm gonna be very much referring to today. And then we had at the end of that, a dialogue forum. And what happened then was uh, uh, that, um, uh, and that was right at, the, um, ooh, right at the end of 2016 or the beginning of 2000, the beginning of 2017, I think. We had a dialogue forum where the 30 other projects came along um, and listened to presentations by the first 14 projects. And then those folk then organized their own projects and they enacted their projects across 2017 and 2018. Whereas the projects in the first round were all from health and social care, the projects from the second round were across a far wider range of disciplines. And as you'll see across those approaches, um, there was a, a range of different kinds of post practicum outcomes intended to be achieved and therefore a range of strategies used to address those. We also ran a student survey and the informants, which we'll go into in a minute, were from, because it, was, it, it coincided with the first uh, round, were students from, from healthcare largely. And the students were asked for what purpose did students want to engage in post-practical interventions? And then what kind of processes did they prefer to participate in? And we're gonna discuss the second of those questions um, in this, this session. Okay, um, one of the things that came up as a list was what kind of interventions would these be? And this was just a very, this was a draft list that was put out to, to stimulate people's thinking. And it really went from you know, very close um, interaction between the student and their teacher, or as it turned out, a clinician or whatever, an expert, through to online moderated by somebody else. And so this was just a series of, of a list really of different kinds of interventions, which we use just to think about the 
the kind of arrangements which, which might progress. But we did include this in the survey for students. So let me go to this, the survey then. We, a total of 484 student informants from the social and healthcare pro programs responded to the survey. However, there were only 369 provided workable responses. And of those, they didn't respond to all of the items. So you'll see some differences in figures. Their gender, age, discipline, um, study mode, um, year and level of study, and national nationality are set out below. So, and, and this, this data comes from a chapter that was written by, um, by uh, Leah Leah and uh, Melissa Kane and myself in the book that's covered this first round. So the students were both male and female, but as you can see, predominantly female. The ages there, um, are clearly not just within school leavers, they're um, mature age students as well. And then there's disciplines, and here are nursing, medicine, midwifery, and allied health. And what you'll see is that nursing students were the large, single largest um, component. Then we had some medical students, midwifery students, and then allied health, which included things like dietetics, um, uh, speech pathology and physiotherapy, as I recall. Uh, the students were largely full-time students, as you can see from the, so these are full-time students. And their level of studies were um, um, largely undergraduate, but not wholly undergraduate. There was also postgraduate students there. And across that sample, we found that the, we asked them what years of study they were in, and you can see the, um, the responses there. And only 12% of them were in the 44, were in the first year. And I think we can presume then that in most programs from, you know, because the second year onwards, the vast majority of the students had had um, reasonable workplace experiences given the programs they're in. Nationality is largely Australian, but some international students, oops. Yeah, okay, uh, I think that's it. Now, in terms of their preferences for interventions, this is what they suggested in terms of timing. What they were saying is that the most strongest preferred one was, <clears throat> excuse me, after every practicum experience, and then earlier in the program, and then after the first experience, and then after a number of having had a number of practical experiences and then towards the end of the course. But as you can see is that they were saying that um, you know, there's, there's timings that they thought were important. The most frequently mentioned one was then after every practicum experience. And of course, we're talking to people who have largely had workplace experiences by the time they've completed this survey. This is what they said. Um, in terms of their preferences and how they rank their preferences for that list of interventions which we used earlier. And the reason we used that list was that this survey was done fairly early in the project and that's what we were basing some of our ideas around. And I'll just go across this top um, listing here, which I think is important to understand. And what you'll see here is that um, HP refers to high preference, they, they preferred that. OK is what you would take that to be. LP is low preference. But also, we also put in a, a, a line which allowed them to say they would not participate. And we thought that was important because you know, of this stuff about time jealousy. And that, that proved to be quite helpful here in looking at the data. And then you'll see that what there is here in the, um, uh, in the th third column from the left, an aggregation of HP and OK. So that is what they believe would you know, be helpful by degree. What you'll see is that if we look at the first um, three in particular, you'll see small groups facilitated by teachers and tutors, small groups meeting periodically um, and facilitated by a placement supervisor and then one-on-one -on -one with the teachers. So they're the ones that were most frequently supported. And of course, this is your vice chancellor's hell because these are incredibly resource intensive. Um, so the very thing that the students want as ideal are probably gonna be quite difficult to resource. Then we come down one-on-one -on -one with a more experienced student. Yes, we can manage that. Um, small groups facilitated by more experienced students. Yep, yep, yep. 
Now, if you look down the other column, which is would not participate, WNP, look down the bottom and you'll see things that students said they simply would not participate in and reasonably high levels. So for instance, 34% said that they would not participate in, in online with peers. Hey, look at what happened at the moment. We're all engaging um, online. And um, then there was, you know, preference not to engage online moderated by tutors. And then presentations to peers was unpopular as is students having to organize it. So what we've got here is some preferences of what the students wanted in terms of interventions, but also some strong statements about what they would prefer not to engage in. And because the students can exercise discretion, clearly um, there's some things here that students simply would not participate in. And I think that that's helpful data. Um, so what the students essentially preferred was personalized and research resource intensive um, options. And from last week's webinar, what we know is that the, in particular, the students were concerned about getting feedback on their progress so that they would be able to understand how effective their preparation is and how well prepared they would be at the end of the course to secure employment upon graduation. Um, Stephen, sorry to interrupt. We've just got yep. a quick question. Are you are you happy to take that? Yes, go go ahead. Yeah. 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 Um, it was just more from Carol Joy. Could you unpack more again the distinction you see between WIE and Will? Oh, all right. Okay. Yes. Well, it it goes back to the difference between education and learning. So education is the provision of experiences. It's the organisation of experiences to achieve particular goals. I mean, that's, that's the common thing, that if we look, for instance, at if we go back to look at the original definitions of curriculum, I mean, the, the study of curriculum really is only, I think that the book that, um, what's his name, wrote in 1947, was one of the first books on curriculum, and he defined curriculum, his name will come to me in a second, as achieving the goals of the school. So curriculum is very much about the path, organising the pathway of experiences, and so the provision of education is what we do. We, you know, we organize classes and we, and we organize experiences and we think about how we can support students learning. So that is what education is about. Um, whereas learning is a, quite a, is a quite a different concept. And learning is, is what people um, change as a result of having an experience. So, um, you, and you can see these, the, the former, and work integrated education is what's referred to by Searle as an institutional fact. It is a product of society. And what we know is, for instance, the vast majority of education provisions are organized by state or churches to achieve particular purposes. And we're seeing that playing out very strongly in, in higher education in Australia at the moment, where, for instance, the federal ministry is saying that the only kind of higher education which the government wants to support is that directly associated with employable outcomes. So, so that's the provision of education um, and learning is a personal fact. It's what the person um, changes as a result of the process of experiencing. So I think it's important we set these apart um, to understand, you know, because what work integrated um, education is about is about organizing experiences, trying to understand how best to achieve the intended goals and then enacting them. And as we'll see shortly, um, all of that can be for naught unless the people who are the object of it, the students, want to engage effectively in it. And I'll give you a, I'll give you an example of years ago. I did work with Linda Sweet on um, um, midwifery students engaging in the use of uh, journals to report their experiences of um, of um, because they had to do what's called follow-throughs. They were called follow-throughs then, um, and um, following through birthing women through the, the, the delivery of babies, and that took about 40 of them. And they're asked to write a, a log on each of them. And the students reported later that what they wrote in the log was really what they, they fed back what they thought their teachers wanted rather than their own learning experiences. So. These learning logs are an artifact. They're a 
an institutional fact that comes from an educational provision. That's quite separate, though, from what the students learned through engaging in those activities. Firstly, the unreal, unrealistic expectation that they could have to engage in 40 follow throughs um, and that this led them, for instance, to, you know, most of these were women with children and families and stuff and the impact that had on them to achieve those outcomes were, 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 were quite remarkable because they actually had to go and find 40 birthing women themselves. So there was two stories here, one that an artifact used to capture their experiences and then what wasn't spoken about was the stress and strains that the students actually had to go through to actually secure for 40 birthing women and then follow them through the birthing process, which included, by the way, um, having worked with a birthing um, a woman right up until the, the birth process and then the husband or the partner saying, didn't want the student to be there at the birth. And all of that effort was for nothing. So there's a key distinction. It's, it's really, I mean, this might sound trite, but it's the difference between, you know, understanding air and aeroplanes. Um, you know, th there's a big difference between those two. So as I said earlier, my, my, in, in making these distinctions, I'm not seeking to um, critique those who use the term work integrated learning to include both work integrated learning and work integrated education. I'm just simply saying at this point in time, the development, I think it's important we separate them out so that we don't um, um, accrue the mistakes that have occurred in how people talk about lifelong learning. So I, I hope that's helpful, Carol Joy. Um, now, um, in terms of um, back to here, what we also did was to try to see whether students had different goals at different points in their study. And in this, what this table shows is that um, you'll see that there's two types of study stages. There's study stage one, which is year one and two students, and then study stage two, which is third, fourth, and fifth year students. So just a way of working with this data to see was when, if there's any difference across the two cohorts of students, whether you know, work integrated learning or particular strategies or particular goals are going to be more important for um, students early in the program and students later in the program. And what you'll see here, by the way, is a very consistent pattern that the um, that stage one students were more desirous of discussing their work experiences than stage two students for every one of those purposes that it seemed to be less important, suggesting perhaps a different set of emphases between um, um, students early in the course and students later in the course. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, post-practical interventions. And I'm gonna focus on the ones from phase one simply because of time and needing to provide some concrete examples. So I want to talk about the focus and the interventions used in phase one, the outcomes that came from them, reported outcomes, and then improvements. So here you see the list of strategies that were in the projects that were in phase one. And I'll just talk through these very briefly. Uh, Tracy Levitt-Jones, who was then at Newcastle, was concerned about improving a nursing students' clinical reasoning. So rather than getting them to write assignments, what she what got them to do is to actually um, present a case orally because that's what you actually have to do in the hospital ward and so students were given this activity of actually um, an assessment process that was based upon clinical scenarios once they'd had their the experience in clinical settings and then report back orally. Gary Rogers, um, medical students, was um, used written assignments um, to get students, medical students, to critically appraise um, into working interprofessionally. So he got them to talk about teamwork that they encountered, what was effective and what was ineffective in collaborative working practice, and then suggestions for improving that. And then um, uh, Harrison, who's an emergency physician from Monash, Julia, so I should have said, um, she used a structured approach to engage medical students in professional exchanges. And I should say that the challenges with medical students are very pertinent because I think they are probably the most time jealous students or would claim to be the most time jealous students. So, so finding success with those students is, and finding relevant experiences and success with those students is important. 
So what Julia did was she organized this experience where um, she um, had a number of the students sitting in, in, in groups and she would then present material to them which they needed to, to have access to and then would engage in small group peer-led activities without teacher facilitation. She would wander around, but she wouldn't actually um, intervene. And this led to a relatively open-ended dis discussions about recent events during uh, clinical practice. And what she reported is that the students really engaged in these and you know, wanted to engage in them effortfully. And they were animated and the students were clearly engaged. And you know, in small groups sharing things that perhaps they wouldn't want to share in a, in a bigger audience. Gary Kerwin, um, in th looking at physiotherapy, was using the students' experiences that, to get them to um, write, prepare applications and for going through uh, job application processes, mock interviews, etc. Linda Sweet um, was an, involved in reflective uh, project on reflective writing for midwifery students um, to develop um, reflective practices using structured prompts to prompt the students into writing activities which were intended to develop their critical reasoning skills. Laurie Grelish used, uh, with nursing, used a series of structured learning circles which were aimed to accommodate different levels of readiness of students, but also to get them to use things like concept maps based uh, to, to make sense of the experiences they'd have and also to engage in group discussions. Carol Steckerty, this is from uh, medical education in Notre Dame in, in, in Fremantle. Um, again, um, with medical students, getting um, uh, students who are at different stages at different points in their clinical rotations to come together to engage in debriefing tutorials that provided an opportunity for the students to share, compare and appraise experiences about, and also to discuss the complexities of clinical practice. And again, these um, activities were engaged with effortfully by the students, uh, according to the accounts. What was important in this one is that um, the students engage in different specialisms across the year, but at the end of the year, they have to take examinations which cover all the specialisms. And this activity allowed students who are perhaps currently working in surgery to be reminded of what happened in um, pediatrics or something like that. So there was, um, you know, the students found value in it and came to engage in it. Um, Libby Cardwell um, um, from um, uh, Speech Pathology at Griffith uh, organized a post-practicum workshops and engaged the students in um, an activity where they considered their work placement experiences and firstly, you know, individually, and then engage in a process of self-evaluation. Um, and this was realized through an activity in which initially the student shared their experiences with just one other person, and then a small group, and then a larger group. And they're able to um, manage, uh, sorry, manage control what was discussed. So that if they could reveal things to a one other student, and if they didn't want that to be revealed at the next level, they would simply say that that's not to be discussed into the whole group activity. And this, and then Libby um, uh, Williams, and this was with dietetic students um, about face-to-face -face reflective post-practicum uh, debriefs for students who work in relative isolation within hospitals and then to integrate those experiences. What was interesting about Libby's study is that dietetic students are sent into hospital in pairs. And so this provided an opportunity for both individual, but also um, a sort of an inherent peer um, learning process to develop. Christy Noble, again, working with healthcare students and nurses um, in particular, as I recall, um, engaged in a process to develop the students' ability to use feedback effectively, which is included being proactive with it. And there was a process there of having an online primer, a workshop, um, a subsequent an activity that allowed them to evaluate their placements and then you know, share and compare with their peers. And this was to develop those students' ability to seek out and to use feedback effectively. 
And then um, Kelly Clancy um, was had a project looking at with physiotherapy students, looking at um, preparing them for employability through drawing upon their work experiences to engage in um, preparing them for um, immediate employment. And then Jenny Newton was also working with nurses and these were nurses who, nursing students who had to go out into community placements. And this kind of placement is often not seen as being particularly um, worthwhile or valued by many students. And, um, and so what she wanted to do was to share the experience of students who are going into these different settings that are relatively isolated and other students can't engage with them by making uh, videos of what are their experiences and then sharing those videos to their peers. So these were the projects. And what you'll see here is there's a range of, as I've just said, there's a range of strategies from oral assessment tasks or written assignments, um, professional exchanges, written, write, written, written application, reflective writing, learning circles, uh, structured clinical debriefs, workshops, face-to-face -face debriefs, personalized feedback, feedback, and then workshops with resume writing, and then students preparing short video clips. The outcomes from their projects were as follows. Um, that the, the, the ones that Tracy Levitt Jones organized that identified strengths and deficits in students learning and applicability to patient safety and care, um, and that students endorsed the use of oral assessments over written assignments. Um, Julia Harrison reported that this um, was very helpful. The approach she adopted was very important for engaging the students in an active process. And the students um, reported that, that, that this was a comfortable environment for them to share and learn from others. And, and they, where they didn't feel they were being judged by clinicians or their teachers. And the, um, the, the outcome of um, Linda Sweet and, and uh, Jennifer Barr's study was that, um, that when they'd been given um, a structure to, in, to support their uh, collective, uh, their individual reflective experiences, that structure actually uh, was helpful for improving those. The concept maps that Laurie Grellish used were deemed to be helpful for understanding students' development, and this gave them a, a, a context to discuss and share with others. And the clinical facilitators also said that the student-led discussions were important and allowed them to understand the students' learning and engagement. And again, with the Carol Steckerty with medical students at, at Notre Dame, um, it was said that these discussions were seen as building a trustworthy, safe and supportive environment for medical students to share and compare their experiences. Libby Cardwell said this was, a, you know, her study found that this was a, a strong opportunity for students to engage in understanding what they learned from their, um, their, their practicum experiences and then share across the, the diversity of experiences across an entire group. Um, yet what was fascinating about this, and it's something I wanna to return to both today and next week, is that the students reported very, very high levels of satisfaction and confidence with this process. They said it was great, really enjoyable, really highly engaged in it. Yet one of their questions in the feedback is, would you participate in it again? And less than half students said they would do. So even though something that students va valued greatly from participating in it, there was still this issue of would they participate in it? And um, uh, Libby Williams' course for the um, uh, for the dietetic students was that this you know, there was positive outcomes reported by the facilitators, facilitators, and this allowed this came from students sharing their experiences and students student reported positive outcomes and a set of four measures designed to support their professional preparation. And then um, in Christy Noble's study, the students reported satisfaction with the process. And one of the comments they made was 
that uh, they thought it would be helpful if the people who are teaching them, both within the university and also in clinical settings, could also ask, uh, access such a training program so they could come to use the feedback process more effectively. And um, Jenny Newton concluded that students using this approach was helpful. They got a better understanding of the requirements of being a community nurse and the kind of requirements of that work. Um, and that was helpful. However, there were also issues with each of these um, um, outcomes, which are just worth sharing briefly. Um, readiness was very important in students' ability to provide effective uh, clinical assessments and represent them orally. Um, that the, the issue of that Julia Harrison came up with, yes, the students engaged with it, but um, this was voluntary and, you know, the issue was then how can we engage with this with a larger number of students? She had a very good turnout, by the way, but she was a concern then about how that um, a greater number of students, would, everybody would turn up and also how their learnings and conclusions and could, could be reported in some sense, but also the importance of maintaining a non-judgmental environment. And as I've said that students from Linda Sweet's um, uh, project that when students were pro provided with a structured experience um, that was seen to be, help the quality of their uh, critical appraisals. And Laurie Grelish reported practical issues finding spaces in busy hospitals and time for these kind of student meetings. Um, the, the clinical facilitators thought they were very helpful and allowed them to support uh, learning through you know, observa observing, you know, observing, coaching, and guiding the conversations. So the feasibility was strong. Students reported specific outcomes. Uh, the issue there of, is of finding opportunities and times and to make this happen. And um, that um, students uh, in the medical students in Carol Steckity's study, said that the survey device may not have fully picked up the richness of the learning that occurs. So we need to be mindful then if we're trying to measure learning of, of how we can do that, particularly in a circumstance where sharing, students are sharing stuff in a, in a psychologically safe environment. And as I've already mentioned that um, the, from Libby Cardwell's study that the student, the project there was about developing professional identity and efficacy and also resilience associated with that work and that the practicum experience was essential to it. However, um, the, this, the idea of the um, intervention um, might be compromised because of students, despite expressing high levels of satisfaction with it, may not have been fully enthusiastic about repeating the activities. Um, the key lessons from Libby Williams you can see there is that even relatively short interventions um, were seen to require a fair bit of resources and so this is difficult. And the, this, and, and the ongoing issue about, you know, is this about assessment or is this about students' professional learning and how do those two issues come together? Um, and the importance of gathering both qualitative and quantitative data, the importance of having skilled facilitators to maximize the process. Um, and some students um, from the reflection, um, sorry, the feedback course that Christy Noble ran, as I've said, um, that uh, they thought it was helpful, but they did have, some of them had difficulty accessing the materials and thought then that this is a process that their teachers and clinical supervisors might have. And yeah, Jenny Newton uh, found it to be helpful. What I do know is though that she had difficulty um, for some of the students participating in this activity because it required them to develop um, if they didn't have the skills to create short videos. Okay, so overall, um, it, there, there are important factors coming from this and these I'm repeating the ones that I rehearsed last week, which were about um, learner expectations. Students uh, valued um, th these interventions. If students value the interventions, they engage effortfully in that, but there, 
issues of personal readiness and stages of professional goals, of preparation and their goals are important. Readiness, the ability of students to actually have the capacity to engage in and learn through work activities and therefore a lack of readiness can inhibit that capacity. Student engagement, um, if students aren't willing to put in the time, aren't willing to engage effortfully, then the learning outcomes will be suboptimal. And you know, this degree, uh, the, sorry, this question of, do we make the activities compulsory, which means virtually you have to make them an assessment item, or which then can lead to superficial engagement and outcomes, or should they be voluntary, um, but that may fail to engage some of the students who are the ones that perhaps most need to engage. So you know, I think Julia Harrison in some sense, and perhaps the project also at Notre Dame, found a, a good midpoint there that they put on an activity that the students had to engage with um, as part of their coursework. And then by integrating that with students, peer-led groups, led to successful outcomes and relatively high levels of attendance, but not um, universal attendance. And then the importance of having a safe environment in which students feel free to share, um, yet can also be subject to educational processes um, so that sharing is directly positive, directed positively and constructively towards educational goals. What has come through in, in, in some of the surveys is that sharing that isn't in some sense facilitated can lead to like a pit of misery, a pit of negativity. So there is a risk of having peer-led processes that there could be unhelpful um, outcomes and this can also potentially become, um, have negative consequences. And designing and acting interventions that, so there's a strong alignment between what needs to be learned and the kind of intervention that um, are being developed. So for instance, those students who said they didn't want to give oral presentations and they would not participate. Now, if your work requires you to give an oral presentation like a nurse to a doctor or another nurse or a patient or the next of kin, it's probably not a bad thing that we actually press students into doing something which they don't like. As long as we can align that with the kind of skills that they will need to exercise in their work. Okay, and that's that book from 2019 that captures a lot of this stuff. So in sum, we need to position the process of post-practical interventions um, to be aligned with clear educational purposes, but also students' interests. That is to assist students engage effectively in work integrated learning experiences. So as I was saying earlier, we, we can organize experiences, the intended curriculum, and then we can enact them. Um, but ultimately, it's students who decide how they engage in them and come to learn from them. So here we're dealing with both institutional facts, that which comes from society and social institutions, and then personal facts, how people come to engage with them. And anything we can do to prepare students to be ready to, to participate in those activities seems to be important. And that, um, that, as I've said already, I think I'm repeating myself, that students having engagement and have explicit links to their learning objectives seems to be important. Their learning objectives, because you know, we, that's what will attract their attention and their engagement. And um, making explicit how these processes can then lead to students continuing education so getting the, for instance, the healthcare students used to working in peer-led discussions is what then leads on to you know, fairly common processes of you know, professional learning that occur in healthcare settings as clinicians come together to discuss cases. And it's just this ongoing process through everyday work in those settings. In this way, then post-practical interventions can realize the outcomes associated for initial occupational preparation and ongoing development through supporting the reconciliation of experiences in both settings. Okay, so um, what I'll do, I'll stop sharing now and hopefully there'll be some questions and then I've gone on far longer than I anticipated. And then what we'll do is we'll respond to some questions and then we'll perhaps put people in groups to um, um, have a discussion. But let's, let's, let's have a, 
bit of a discussion first and a dialogue. So I'll stop sharing and hopefully I'll be able to see a few faces. Uh, Stephen, I think Megan had a question in the um, chat just about the book. Did you, you want to discuss? I'll let Megan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, wondered, I wondered if that name came to you and whether that whether I had found it or not. That was so what, What's that? Sorry. I'd wondered if the name of the book, the author of the book from 1947 about curriculum that you mentioned earlier when you couldn't recall the name, I found Stratemeyer. No, no, what's his name? Um, um, he's from Chicago. It'll come to me in a second. Um, yeah, he was a, he wrote this book, which was probably the first book on curriculum theory. Oh, um, um, I won't look at my phone now, but I'm annoyed because I, sh I use it a lot. Don't, don't, don't try too hard or you won't remember is my experience. No, it'll come back to me. I mean, the point there is that we, although obviously experiences have been learned, um, you know, organised for a long time, it was only this, this book that was written, oh, it was there then a second, um, that was relatively recent. And it, for instance, the Journal of Curriculum Studies was only, I think it was first commenced in 1967. So I'm simply saying that this, thing called curriculum um, that we you know curriculum studies and considerations of it is fairly recent and um, oh it's annoying me now and is um, is very recent mm -hmm. and it's evolving um, and that's but I I trade a lot on those three concepts of curriculum which is the which is the the importance of the intended curriculum what is supposed to be achieved then actually what happens in practice when what is supposed to happen is enacted and that's shaped by the, um, you, know, the, you know, the resources you've got access to, the kind of experiences you can provide, the expertise of the teacher. And then, you know, ultimately, and somebody who, you know, we're all interested in students learning, ultimately the most important form of curriculum is the experience curriculum. What sense students make of it? So to give you an example, for instance, I, you know, uh, as um, Louise mentioned, um, yeah, so the, um, Sarah's saying about the hidden curriculum, that's often very much encaptured with the enacted curriculum. Um, and the hidden curriculum, technically the hidden curriculum is unintended processes that occur. Now I'll give you some examples of that is, you know, if the classroom teacher in the school gets the girls to clean up and gets the boys to lift the heavy things, um, implicitly, there's a message coming across there. In some work I'm doing on the standing of vocational education, what we're finding is that it's the everyday things that teachers say in the classroom, quite unintentionally, have a profound impact upon um, what students see as being valued, etc., in their um, in their studies. Um, so um, that's the hidden curriculum, and then the experience curriculum. So just to tell you, you know, to, to illustrate this is. Um, is that I said I used to teach um, in vocational education garments. Now my ex industry experience was largely in menswear. Um, and so I taught a course that was largely in women's wear. And you could always tell my students because I always forgot which side the buttons go on and the side they put the buttonholes on are different than men's for women's. So you could always tell my students because they always had the buttons on the women's garments on the wrong side because I always forgot that women's you know, garments are bottom the other way around. Now I'm joking there, but that what I'm saying is that is the intent that that is the enacted curriculum of what the teacher brings to the particular setting. Hence the importance of time jealous teachers. If they're not bothered, they don't think the workplace experience is important, they'll not get emphasis to it. But then ultimately um, is the experience curriculum, and that is the sense that um, uh, students um, uh, make of it. Tyler, Tyler, um, yeah, Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R. He wrote the first book, 1949, Curriculum Theory. Um, it's hard, oh, sorry, I, I, I just missed the one that came up then on, um, um, oh, okay. So there was another question, I think, that just came up that just popped up then disappeared. Uh, uh, it's Sarah said it is hard to ever really have the big picture understanding of what is actually enacted. Yes, yes. And and um, I mean, there's ways of doing that, by the way, um, 
if you look at um, models of curriculum evaluation, they tend to be try and take in the broad range of factors that shape what happens when the curriculum is enacted. Um, and so if you look at stakes, uh, model of curriculum evaluation, what you see is a conscious effort to capture everything that shapes the process of, of education. And that is, you know, things like students, the exp experience of the teachers, the resources available, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can imagine, for instance, the, the differences um, of running um, any of these courses in um, uh, a university which sits close to a hospital, such as the one that some of these studies were done down the Gold Coast, where the university is here and across the road is the, is the Gold Coast University Hospital. Between that and where, you know, perhaps a, a course in a regional town where there's only one small hospital nearby. So, the, you know, there's these, these issues of, of, the, of, the, of the kind of experiences you're simply able to provide because of physical location. Um, all of those sort of things play out. And then you've got issues of students, engagement, resources, et cetera. So yes, yes, um, Sarah, there's a whole set of, I think it was Sarah, there's a whole set of factors there that shape um, the enacted curriculum. Thanks, Stephen. What about the perceived? I mean, I think there's more than the three. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, see, I, that's why I refer to the experience curriculum because mm. it's what sense you make of experiences. Mm. So for, I'll give an example of what, what you might describe as a perceived curriculum. And that is some years ago, I was involved in a, but no, I was, I was with some, there's some stuff with medical students. And um, there were, I was talking to a man who runs the program for New South Wales medical students. Thank you, that's it, Ralph Tyler. Thank you very much, Megan. And um, the, he was based at a hospital in Lithgow, which is just the other side of the Blue Mountains. And he would provide um, very good experiences, he argued, for the medical students from um, the Sydney universities. And in New South Wales, the medical students had to do three, work, three weeks of rural placement as part of their degree. What he was saying is, though, that most of them resented doing it. And despite the fact that he provided a, an induction program when they arrived, nice afternoon tea, staff there to meet them, accommodation that they had, was, was organized for them, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, the students didn't perceive this to be um, an important experience for them. They wanted the quickest route through to you know, uh, their preferred specialisms, um, and they didn't see themselves working in rural settings. So even though know, you have you know, you know, the, the intention is to engage them, the intended curriculum, the, what's enacted is a, is a welcoming experience, um, provision of rotation around wards, unless the student wants to engage with it effortfully, and in this case, they didn't, um, that, um, or many of them didn't, um, that you know, the, the richness of that experience is potentially lost. So I would put what you're referring to as the perceived curriculum as being very much in terms of how the, um, the, the learner comes to experience it. So there's the experience, what is provided, but it's how the person comes to experience that. And, you know, we see this playing out pretty blatantly, I think, um, in the good old USA at the moment, where what appears to be by any measure, a very objective result is being experienced and being perceived quite differently by um, uh, different elements of the uh, population. So that's that same process, I think, um, Sarah. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, my camera's not working. Um, no, that's good. It's been a really good discussion. Thank you. Any other questions before we, how many folk have we got online, Louise? You're, you're mute. I'm about uh, 16. I think we worked it out in two groups of six. Okay. Yeah, good. That works. Yep. Yeah. So what we thought we would do now is, if, unless there's any final questions, is pop you in two, was it two groups? Yeah, two groups. Two groups of six. And I'm just going to share, and I think you've got a message about what we want to discuss. But just in case, I'm just going to share my screen again. And the, there's just three questions that, which one is it? Or oh, this is when I get nervous. 
Um, I hope that's, why is it there? So I hope that, um, right down the bottom, there are three questions, which is, um, I want you to address, which is, um, how would it be possible to provide the kinds of exper experiences that students prefer, you know, those intensive ones they want, and, and which of these kind of strategies I've talked about, I've referred from the first phase, would be appropriate or helpful for your programs? And given those issues, in what ways were the improvements suggested helpful for you? So you're just imagining that you know you were involved in those projects, in what ways would um, you know, perhaps improvements or changes be made for them to be effective for your situation? So I hope that's clear. So the first question is about how do we cater for you know, the students, what their students want? You know, is it should be the what is what they want or is it should be what can be? And then which kind of strategies from the ones that were mentioned that um, you, would you find helpful for your area? And then the issues of challenges and improvements that, that might be made. So if we could go into those groups now and spend about, how much time have we got? About um, 30 minutes perhaps. Um, discussing those, and then we'll come back together for a feedback session. Okay, can we uh, uh, let it yep, go? Um, we'll just move everyone to rooms now. Thank you. I've also put the questions in the chat as well. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Was a good session, Stephen. How was that? Okay. No, that was great. I got it. I was actually. Here we go. Okay. Is everybody back? Is that a silly question? <clears throat> so, um, should we work around the groups to see oh, people still coming back in to see the issues that you discussed? And should we start with the first one about how do we address students' expectations about a highly personalized? process of engagement. Any responses there? Well, we were wondering in our group if we redid re that survey whether students' ideas might be different now post-COVID, where they've had a lot more telehealth and yeah. I guess also where they're perhaps more aware of how precarious work is and what might be the differences. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, I think our experience over the last six months is just transformed people's views about um, this kind of technology and what you can do with it and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good point. Yeah. Stephen, would the survey that you used then be able to be used again now um, and repeated? And yes, I mean, I, I, the result well, well, yeah. Um, in fact, I'm trying to think who it is. Um, somebody's taken that survey because we only use the survey really with um, uh, medical and health, sorry, healthcare and social care students. And um, part of the consideration is are the findings so? Because one of the reasons I should have said with the first phase of, of focusing on healthcare, there was, there's a couple of reasons behind it. One is that they've got very long traditions of providing practicum experiences. So we wanted to draw upon a group of people who are very used to, you know, and sect sectors very used to providing these experiences. That was the rationale for um, having that. And they were the ones we surveyed. 
And it would be interesting. I'm trying to think, one of, somebody's actually taken the survey and is going to apply it, and I can't think who it is now. And it would be interesting to see that if that was the case more broadly across uh, a greater range of, of occupations. But I, I go back to Abigail's point, and that is, you know, I'm doing work up in Singapore with CET, Continuing Education and Training, and, you know, the strong preference there was for face-to-face -face stuff from data gathered prior to COVID. And so much has changed now with, with technology um, that I think lots of, you know, we need to probably re-gauge things, recalibrate things in terms of what's possible and what's useful and what's not. So I think it's a very good point. Well, our group grappled with that in terms of um, students not knowing what they don't know. And hence coming to the importance of um, their managing their expectations and prior preparations. And if I was ever asked, what's the one key learning I've ever taken away from Stephen Billet's work? It's the agentic student. And I think that's something you've really contributed, that notion, Stephen. And so yeah. enabling the student to be agentic seems to be really critical in that preparation phase. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's true. And that's why I'm, I'm keeping emphasizing the importance of understanding what students want out of this thing. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it's often, um, you know, what the students have asked for in terms of their preference for those activities are, are the ideal. Mm. Um, and we just know that the idea of having one-on-one, -on -one, you know, interactions with you know, teachers and clinicians is just very resource intensive. Um, and, you know, it's just not really feasible, I wouldn't have thought, in the contemporary era. Um, and so it's, 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 it's the what is um, and then the what should be and, you know, the, it's the ideal. Um, and how we manage to address students' um, needs in ways which, you know, are realistic and resource possible. I mean, it was interesting because one of the assumptions I went into this thing, picking upon Carol Joy's point, was that the students would be very keen on organising these experiences and managing them. And that came from some earlier work where um, in some of the healthcare areas, the students really wanted to take a lead role. But in this study, that, that was really turned on its head. Um, and it would seem that it was interesting. We did an analysis because the nursing students were the largest cohort. And we did an analysis, we broke off the, um, uh, the younger age um, student nurses from the older student nurses, older age student nurses. The idea is that the younger ones are more likely to be school leavers <clears throat> um, who don't have any clinical experience. And then the older ones are possibly um, students who've done the, the RN, sorry, the um, RE, the um, process of being like a nurse assistant that comes through vocational education to see, and they've had practical experience to see whether there's any difference across the cohort. And there was some differences, but not, but not markedly. And it seemed that even the older students, many of whom would have been, um, 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 well, it's not registered nurses, it's certified nurses. Anyway, they wanted to get feedback from um, experienced others clinicians or their teachers to be reassured of their progress as well. So it was kind of, although there was a slight different emphasis in it, both groups of students wanted reassurance in some sense from somebody who was authoritative. And so there's that kind of reassurance that comes from an authoritative person, but it's also how we guide um, their thinking and acting, um, you know, how we allow their agency to um, be directed towards the kind of goals that need to be achieved. I think that's a difficult question. And it was really telling when we, I mean, I'm just talking because there's no else coming in, but it was really telling when we did that work with Linda Sweets that um, it was the graduates that took us aside and said, with those learning logs, we just fed you back what we thought you wanted, you know, and this is the, supposed to be the epitome of the, of a pedagogue device where the students actually you know, express their views and explore concepts. And they're telling us we're just responding to the assessment criteria. <clears throat> that was so brilliant. 
did you find um, the um, did you find the the strategies that were adopted interesting or helpful for your fields? Uh, we did very much, and uh, the thing that we discussed is that there were so many wonderful things in there um, that were not a one size fits all. Uh, so there's a lot of different things there that can be tailored to different projects and proposals and the feasibility of using them all would have to be questionable. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, yeah. but then yeah. and I came from a creative industries background and the others were much more in, in health and nursing. So we discussed the differences in approach between the different disciplines and types of will and the different things that are possible. Um, but yes, I, I thought they were fantastically helpful, uh, each yeah. in context. And what we try to encourage people to do is not to say, this is the greatest and latest thing that we're doing, but to actually to be fairly critical about it because people were trialing stuff um, and to see what worked and, and, and what didn't work. Um, and that seemed to be important. So you know, a lot of those reports um, were fairly open about the issues and you know, the, the, the abiding issue that came through, sorry, the most consistent issue that came through was student engagement. <clears throat> And how we get students to participate. So what? So Hugh, your areas is creative areas. Uh, yeah, I, I've been at Creative Industries at QUT. Hello, everybody. Um, for about ten years, and I've just moved yeah. to UNE, uh, and I'm yeah. about to write a will program or yeah. create a will program for Creative Industries at UNE. So I, I think this is a fantastic session. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, and it was funny how so many of the things you said, particularly that three phase structure of you know, set up expectations, what is, what's, what's supposed to happen, what actually happened, and then what mm. difference does that make? And that's philosophically, if not pedagogically, that's always been the approach I've taken. Mm. So that was very affirming. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Can I ask yeah. what sorts of things creative industries students would be doing at UNA and therefore what sorts of work integrated learning they would be doing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um... I'm from health. So <laughs> All right. So, and it, it, well, an in, incredible diverse range. So we, we want students to be working in theatre production and event management. And, you know, the first thing I'll have to do is go and find all the organisations that could use students. Uh, and then, of course, the question comes down to how much do you hand them an opportunity and how much do you make them go and find their own opportunity? You know, uh, one of the things is, particularly with country show societies, there is stupendous amounts of work that students can do. And there's no reason why a graphic designer in Perth can't do, you know, social media marketing for the Armadale Show Society. Mm. So there's a whole bunch of issues around that mm. that need to be <laughs> worked through. And again, some of those at the moment with the pandemic as well. Um, exactly. You know, we're an eighty percent online cohort anyway. So you know, the, anything that we do has to be deliverable in, at the very least in mixed modes, you know, where maybe it's an online enrollment, but the person turns up for a couple of weeks and, and is in situ. Mm. So I got to with all that. Can I come and play? <laughs> what I would you like to play? Production. Can I help with the theatre production? <laughs> By all means. By all means. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's right. See, and the next, there, there's the next issue is that obviously the teaching staff know that in theatre, the, the, real bang for your buck value for students is in working with professional theatre companies in Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne. But mm -hmm. uh, there's an awful lot of, you know, cognate experiences students can have working with amateurs in country towns. Yeah. And there are a whole lot of ethical issues around taking jobs off people working for the, you know, which are quite fraught in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, taking jobs off people working with the professional companies with limited budgets. Mm -hmm. So we've got to work through all that too. In the, um, in the study we did in uh, 2008, 2010, across the IRU universities, um, from James Cook, there was a focus from one of the projects on the creative industries. And there, what, oh, what's his name, got them to students to do was to develop a portfolio. Um, and the portfolio was to, um, to understand all the possible potential places for their employment in that region, that area, and how they'd go about doing it. So um, it, 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 it actually pressed the students into understanding their field and how they might come to find opportunities to do photography, art, all sorts of things. 
Um, I thought that was an interesting strategy. It was kind of building upon, but using practicum experiences, but it was actually projecting their um, activities, you know, beyond graduation to when they'd be seeking work. So that was done in a, in, a, in a community where, you know, wouldn't have the range of options that perhaps we have in Brisbane, for instance. One of our group members who had to leave was actually in science at um, Edith Cowan, am I right? Did I get that right? Um, and the, she I was talking about, taken. right, yeah. sorry. Um, hmm. She was talking about, they were talking about um, doing them in, even in first year and doing some of that career planning as part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's also what we've been doing at uh, EC Edith Cowan as well is um, is building it in the whole of course, like so not just um, you know it's it's like Abigail was saying before about the um, the the you know the before and middle and after, but at the whole of course way of looking at it, so that when you're in first year, you start to think about this is what Karen was talking about from Deacon, you start thinking about what it is that you're um, you want to do, and then build that in throughout the the whole way through and give lots multiple opportunities for students to reflect on what it is that they're doing, why they're doing it, how it connects to their outside work and all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and then to their placement. Um, and in our in our workbook, in um, our portfolio for Edith Cowan University, we worked it out with um, the careers department as well. So we, we talked about, um, you know, we've got like a page there on, like you're saying, Stephen, about the, um, um, who are you meeting along the way? Who are your connections? Who, you know, keep a record of all those things and build that into your understanding of not just yourself, but positioning yourself in there. A bit like the Ruth Bridstock sort of stuff on the, um, what's it called? The, but you know, the- the Portfolio careers. Uh, um, Abigail, what's her thing called with the, um, the, uh, like the it's like the social networking sort of thing, but social is not the right word. Community yeah. practice, career networks, or something like that. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten the word. Um, I'll come back with it later. Well, that's that's something else that we were big on is making the students apply for their own job, because in the creative industries there are very few large institutions where you get a registration and you're suddenly qualified and and able to. So a big part of what we did was make them formally write a CV and write a job application and. And as Faith said, um, map those opportunities and then go and get one for themselves. And I had one conversation with a student in the very first lecture of that before the lecture even began. And I'd taught her before in another unit. She came up and said, oh, I said, have you got a placement yet? And she said, no, I've been negotiating with this person in Sydney and they're being very slow to get back to me and so on and so forth. And part of the professional learning was, why are you in this lecture? Go and ring her and get you know, get your get yourself a placement, and by the end of that lecture, she had organised a placement, which was just fantastic. But when when it comes to employability and all those things in the creative industries, it's you know it's the people who want the job and are prepared to go and find it that get it. So that's a core part of the curriculum of of expectation, I think. Yeah, yeah, and it would seem that for a greater percentage of workers, that will be um, a big issue in the foreseeable future yeah particularly post-covid yeah yes yeah i mean it's, um of course i'm sure you're aware that the minister tiernan has got big plans for work integrated learning um and he's got this new policy and in of it's focused on um interaction between enterprises and universities so there seems to be a you know strong interest in it by government um to, to continue. So hopefully there'll be, you know, appropriate support and you know, strong community to engage and learn from each other from all of this stuff. So, yeah. And some of the folding stuff or the, or a virtual version of the folding stuff. Money, that's what they Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seems to be a bit short supply um, for higher education at the moment. Um, Anyways, perhaps we should work for, was it, no, who got the money? Was it, was it Fox, was it? Anyway, somebody else, uh, never mind, won't go there. Um, so, um, yeah, but certainly, the, so the, I'm hearing from Canberra again, the focus on work integrated learning, which has been, hasn't been a, a key focus for some time. So hopefully these ideas will have purchase um, more broadly. I'm conscious that it's 12.30. I'm conscious that you have other commitments to go, but. Thank you very much for participating in today's activity and um, hopefully um, I'll see some of you 
next week for the final webinar when we'll talk about this issue and how we go about addressing how we engage with time jealous or time pressure students. So hopefully um, we'll have that opportunity and hopefully we'll have more conversations then. Okay, I look forward to catching up with some of you then. In the meantime, look after yourselves and stay well. Okay. Thank you, All Stephen. Thanks, and we'll everyone. send out Wonderful we'll session. send out the slides as well. We're going to send out the slides. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah that'll happen. So we'll send. Yeah. So we'll email out everything. So you've got a record, and then in, yeah. in time, there'll be videos available. Don't, don't forget, Stephen's got the website that all the materials from this project will be published on. Yeah. Yeah. Just send them out in the email as well. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Look after yourselves. Okay. See you. Take care. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.